Welcome to High Tech Heroes, the program that takes you behind the scenes of today's high tech industries, where you can meet the people and examine the ideas creating tomorrow's technology. And now, coming to you from the studios of Foothill College, high atop the mountains overlooking Silicon Valley, here's your host, Sherwin Gooch. Hello, I'm Sherwin Gooch. Welcome to High Tech Heroes. Our guest this week was born in Grodno, Poland. He was awarded a bachelor's in engineering from Drexel University and a master's from UCLA. Our guest worked as a technician on the very first commercial electronic digital computer. He then helped develop telemetry systems at Cape Canaveral and designed magnetic recording products. At Hughes Aircraft, our guest worked on systems to process radar data, and then at RAND Corporation, he worked on issues in computer privacy and long-range forecasting, as well as inventing packet switching. This makes him the father of all the derivative packet switch networks which followed. Becoming an entrepreneur, he co-founded many companies, including Institute for the Future, Cable Data Associates, Packet Technologies, Comprint, Equatorial Communications, Telebit, Stratacom, Metricom, and Interfax. Concurrent to these activities, our guest published over 60 papers, testified before the Congress of the United States, and secured many patents, including some relating to packet switching, the Telebit Ensemble Modem, and Spread Spectrum Systems Fundamental to the VSAT. Some of our guests' most recent awards include the ACM Communications SIG Annual Award, both the Alexander Graham Bell Medal and the Edwin H. Armstrong Award from the IEEE, and most recently, the Marconi International Fellowship Award. When I was at Packet Cable, there was an office at the end of the hall which contained more data books than anyone else had. I was impressed beyond words when I was told that this was the office of the company president. I now have the honor of welcoming to our program that man, the inventor of packet switching and a prolific entrepreneur, Mr. Paul Barron. Hello, Hi. Paul. Hi, Sherwin. Good seeing my old friend. <laughs> yeah, well, welcome to High Tech Heroes. Well, thank you. Good being here. Wow, it's great to have you here. So, um, you worked uh, as a technician on the first uh, commercially available digital Yeah, computer, just out of school and uh -huh. needed a job, and there were these crazies building this machine, and and I was involved with light testing of the components. And uh, I was only there about six months. But during that time, I convinced myself these damn things will never work. Because uh -huh. in those days, every diode was different. And you test them to find out what part of the circuit to use. Oh, that's incredible. And, uh, the, so, well, Cray the, selects memory circuits now. So right, well, <laughs> <laughs> nothing worked right. Yeah. And there's so many parts, and uh, things would fail, and this would go wrong and figure there's no future to computers. So uh, what was that computer? That was the, became the first Univac. So this was at uh, Eckert Mockley? Eckert Mockley mm -hmm. Computer Company. Was so Univac 1, that's, Univac. Uh, that's incredible, a lot of tubes. So you, did you have to change tubes often? Or? Uh, well, I was in the life testing and, and uh, testing the tubes and find, well, this tube wouldn't work and that couldn't take this voltage. And uh, that we convinced ourselves that uh, uh, this this is pretty pretty flaky stuff. Yeah, I no, no future in computers. Well, sure. You know, I have a, a manual for the Iliac One, which uh, actually the Ordbeck, which was the version they made for the government. But uh, that was such an odd machine. I remember it was really sort of an asynchronous machine. They would look at the ripples in the mm -hmm. uh, most significant bit or in the carry bit, mm -hmm. and it, when those ripples died away, they figured it was time to go to the next instruction. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't. I guess it's an asynchronous machine, really, but. Uh, Anyway, so what kind of diagnostic tools did you have? Oh, gee, you know, voltmeters and scopes, and uh, that uh, at this time it was it was just the beginnings, and we'd find things like uh, sleeping sickness when a tube was in the zero state and it went in the one state, it mm -hmm. may miss the first pulse. Now things would pull out your hair. One of the reasons they have so little hair left is. But you sort of fun. decided how often they changed the tubes. Well, anyways. it didn't. It didn't get quite that far. I was only there about six months and. Because uh, with the Iliac, they, they pulled out all the, I guess they were 12 AT7 and 12 AX7s, mm -hmm. just truckloads. Every truck 200 loads, hours, yeah. I think, they'd, they'd change all the tubes out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so uh, that was a lot of good hobby material. There. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, did you coin the phrase uh, computer privacy? No, I, I got involved in that subject, sort of a little side thing. I uh, gave a keynote speech at the Fall Joint Computer Car Conference, I guess it was about 1965. And I was getting concerned about using the social security number to, to tie records together. 
and uh, a copy of the talk was uh, uh, sent to uh, Congressman Gallagher, uh, who was uh, concerned because the FBI was looking at him and he was getting very interested in, uh -huh. in privacy. Uh -huh. And uh, so we had, we had uh, some hearings, and uh, I guess I'm the first computer nerd that testified to testified Congress, to Congress on, huh? on saying, hey, we, we may have a problem here. Well, what, what are the kind of problems that, uh, that you think are a problem now that worry you now about computer privacy? Oh, I think we're in a heck of a lot better shape because now we realize you know, what the issue is, mm -hmm. and we may have gone overboard in some of the craziness. Of, but as long as people understand that, that it is a problem, I feel pretty happy. You know, once it's identified, you know the magnitude, and we can go from here. Right. Well, now, you're, you're really the father of packet switching. What, what exactly I, I is packet switching? That. Well, uh, that was done uh, at the Rand Corporation in the very early 60s when uh, there was a problem of, of uh, building a command and control system that could survive attack, and uh, that it was a very dangerous time uh, mm -hmm. for the world and that uh, they had two powerful countries, both with uh, nuclear weapons, a uh, high level of paranoia, mm -hmm. and... Uh, but now, packet switching itself is what? It's like, I mean, I've it's always heard very, it's, it's like addressing a letter in an envelope. Yeah, and, and the, the reason for this uh, packet switching came about as a, as a solution to a problem, and that is if we have a communication network and it got cut up, we found that there were paths through the network that one could draw we had no way of getting signals from one point to the other. So we said, ah, let's chop the signals into little pieces, and we'll address each of the piece, mm -hmm. like a smart worm, and the worm could find so its like way through. Sort of like data flow? Or yeah, you have, you have this little envelope, and you look at it, postman, now, master looks at it, and says, oh, this goes in this direction. What happens uh, if two of them get there? Well, it's fine. You know, you, can, you put a little, you look at the cancellation dates, and mm -hmm. you look at the first, open the first letter, then open up the second letter. So if one gets a little yeah, ahead, it's the same okay. letter, then you throw the second one away, yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. And you always make sure you keep a carbon copy of whatever you sent. <laughs> so then if you got trouble, you send it. Send copy. it again, huh? So that's so, about all it is. Now, now, exactly the problem you were working on, which caused you to devise, I mean, I guess this is well, a, a case where necessity was in It was necessity, yeah. Uh, that, uh, and, uh, that it was necessary to find a way of getting communication through sort of a fishnet that had holes in it. Mm -hmm. So you weren't sure in advance what links would be available to you. So and, and the message the, the itself, the links might be way. gone because uh, they had been blown away by uh, nuclear well, weapons, right? So, some somebody is not, uh, you know, has different viewpoints. I see. Yourself, so just in case. Reason. Okay. But the idea was that we'd be more st have a more stable situation if we could trust the communications mm -hmm. survive. Mm -hmm. because the, you you couldn't do anything as as important as stopping an, the result of an accident. You right. Know, crazy things happen, yes. so it's important to always maintain communications. So that was the then, problem, and uh, I understand that this work was not classified. No, we kept it unclassified. And, and why was that? Uh, well, we figured that both sides having secure, reliable communication systems uh, was a safer situation uh, than otherwise. So that's really uh, the reason that we're, we're here today, well, maybe, to, know. Uh, we know we, to uh, disarm. We, well, that the, the whole purpose of you know, that military exercise was to try to cool things until people regain their so, common sense. So the idea is that if I know that you have a, uh, a doomsday machine, really, yeah. and you and I have one, you know that I have one, then you're a little safer. We're locked in this then, uh, embrace. You know, if one doesn't have one, yeah. Yeah, right. Okay, well, that sounds like about the most humane use of technology that I've uh, ever heard of. So uh, we'll be right back after this message. You, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. And I will faithfully execute the office of the presidency of the United States. The office of the presidency of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. The Constitution. The words we live by. Races are prepared for danger. The probability is there. You don't even start a race car without your seatbelt on. Without it, I wouldn't even be here. Men, I know what to expect on the track. 
It's driving with amateurs on the highway that scares me. Drive like a pro. Buckle up. Well, welcome back to High Tech Heroes. Paul Barron has just told us how his keeping packet switching declassified lowered the probability of nuclear war. Now we can explore some more of his earth-shaking ideas. So, Paul, what can you tell us about Institute for the Future? Well, that one started in 1968, was Rand at the time, and uh, we're getting interested in some social problems that are facing the country. And the thing that, that concerned us is that the lead time for solution of many of these problems was much, much longer uh, than uh, we, we felt uh, that necessary if we had better long-range planning tools that we can see things a little clearer. Because at that time, uh, planning was a two-year or five-year cycle. We wanted to extend that to 10 or 15 years. And uh, we didn't have the tools. We didn't know what we were going to do. So we set off to create a new not-for-profit institute, which is uh, still in business up the street here, many, oh, many right. years later up in Sand Hill Road. Long story. And uh, the, the, the purpose of the Institute was to develop tools for long-range forecasting, mm -hmm. better methodology. Uh, for example, at the time, we got two reports, one saying that, the, uh, that the, uh, there's uh, global warming, we have greenhouse effect, and the Earth's going to get warmer, and the other saying, no, we're moving into the Ice Age, if we look right. at it. So we wondered which of the two reports are right. It's like black body radiation or uh, yeah, and, you know, greenhouse that, effect. That the, these are, we just didn't have very good tools, and I think we still don't have very good tools, but, but we've come a long way. It is general purpose time. kind of things. I mean, I know yeah. NSF was talking about the uh, oil or or gasoline shortage, and then when the when the ad actually happened, they started talking about a shortage of water. And now yeah. I'm starting to see that. <laughs> but what what I think more people the institute really solved much of its need uh, fairly early because we we're saying uh, let's look at a longer time horizon, and uh, it was sort of kooky at the time, mm -hmm. but it very quickly became respectable. So the need for the Oh, so this is sort of founded future uh, it, forecasting. It, it was one of the factors. Technology uh, forecasting? Factors, yeah. What, uh, could you give an example of one methodology that... that well, uh, one of the, the uh, well, we didn't develop, but one of the founders at, mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, co-founders of the Institute, uh, Olaf Helmer, Norm Godalki, uh, did it at Rand, it's called uh, Delphi, where you have ah. a bunch of experts and you extract information, keep their sources anonymous, then present back the results, right. and then ask people to reconsider. So those who have a strong reason for the position maintain it, and those that don't. And uh, you can use it for things like a lot of people working on the same IQ test will score about 20 points higher. Mm -hmm. So it does have a, a, a mechanism amplified, and it's a very powerful so tool. So Delphi came out of, of Institute Well, no, for the Delphi came, came out of RAND. Oh, okay. and uh, that the but the people that uh, one of the tools that the institute uh, used quite a bit in its okay. early days. That's great. Um, what kind of long-term issues do you think are going to be a problem now? Any oh, problem? gee, the <laughs> or, or anything that's going to be great in the future. Well, I think the probably it's just the uh, overpopulation of the world. You know, we we just uh, aren't uh, slowing down, and if you take that to its end conclusion. Mm -hmm. Uh, something will have to change. Yeah, I learned about Delphi through the Heinz von Forster kind of people, and also mm -hmm. about uh, limits to growth. So, um, so what about uh, spread spectrum? Was it used in anything prior to? Yeah, I think spread spectrum. Uh, just reading a, a book uh, where Paul Green uh, probably did some very early work on that, and for communication, telephone communications between uh, Roosevelt and Churchill in World War uh, mm -hmm. Two. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's been used by the military in many applications, and, and uh, what we did with it is use it for a very small dish satellite. VSAT stands for a very small aperture satellite, very small dishes, two feet dishes. Very small aperture. I mean, it's very small satellite dishes, so you can okay. put these things on your roof or out a window. And uh, the company was built in that, because when we started the company, all the satellites were very low power, mm -hmm. and they took big antennas. So by making, by using the signal processing that you get with spread spectrum, we're able to greatly reduce the size of the antenna. Uh, and this antenna. was uh, frequency hopping? Or? No, it was uh, direct sequence. Direct sequence. Direct sequence. Uh -huh. uh, uh, complicated, but uh, it well, worked. Well, I think direct sequence is simpler than, than the frequency, frequency hopping. But uh, anyway, okay. Um, so 
What exactly is spread spectrum? Can you tell us? Some well, uh, that imagine two guys who are trying to communicate, uh, and there are a lot of signals on the band, and both the receiver and transmitter are able to know where the other guy is. So you mm -hmm. move, your, move your receiver back and forth very quickly, and you find that uh, whatever holes in the band are available, you use. So that permits you to work through uh, interference, and the interference could be noise, and uh, it allows uh, using uh, uh, less energy than you would uh, with a uh, very uh -huh. simple signal. Now, s it seems like uh, by changing the frequency like this all the time, you would generate incredible sidebands. I mean, That's okay. Because, you know, frequency is That's right, because the receiver is moving with you and looking at the exact same sidebands. So, so the two are in sync. Yeah, works out. Do um, you think you could do that uh, instead of a, a repeating sequence? I mean, they talk about code multiplexing, where mm -hmm. you use a different code for your random mm -hmm. number generator. Do you think you could do it with a code? This is Mark Rustad's idea. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, could you do it with a code where you pick one and just let it go and it never repeats? Oh, yeah. They do as that for secrecy systems. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We figured that it would be that, even uh, better than... Yeah, that, that the old uh, one-time crypto systems had a, a random number of tapes. Very hard to synchronize, though. Well, once you synchronize and keep them in sync, oh, it's see. very hard to... Uh, there's a story you know. about some uh, ship, I think, that uh, got taken because they couldn't synchronize. But, well, it's in the past, and I don't know if it's far enough in the past. So uh, how do you use spread spectrum exactly in Equatorial? Well, it was a way of uh, uh, just allowing us to spread the energy with a two-foot dish or a very small dish transmitting we'd have a number of satellites in the beam and that was a no-no the mm -hmm. fcc says no you can't have a small antenna because it'll spread too many satellites in the beam right so what we did is by spreading the energy the energy that any satellite saw in its passband was so low as to be negligible so this is an uplink a small yeah this small is this is uplink. this is this gave the the uh, well you have the, you have a downlink problem and you have an uplink yeah. problem yeah. Now, the uplink problem, you have to be sure you, that, that all these people with little antennas don't point them at other satellites and mess them up. Now, so by spreading the energy, you get away from that problem. You know, in the, gosh, in the early 70s, control data, I was consulting, they made a calculation that there was a fixed amount of bandwidth and really footprint. The mm -hmm. product of those was fixed on the Earth, especially for geosynchronous orbit. Mm -hmm. And so um, they thought that there were going to be a limited number of satellites, and it was going to be <laughs> terrible, you know, a terrible uh, uh, jockeying to get use of the satellites. Now, it seems to me with spread spectrum, does that change the actual bandwidth calculations? Because you can have footprints overlap now. And yeah, just do code that's right. That's right? right. And you're you're in a domain where you, digital domain where one signal can just be a little stronger than the other, and it works. Well, there's still some limit, but I'm not sure yeah. I know. Um, I'm not sure how to calculate it. <laughs> it's not as easy. Well, we'll have a beer and talk about great, it. Great, great, in about a half hour. <laughs> anyway, um, what is packet telephony? Well, uh, once upon a time, people thought packets were great for data because it was very slow. You went from one node and you verified, and you went to the next right, node. Right. Now, as we start getting higher speed data links, such as links running at one and a half megabits a second, mm -hmm. and if we chop up the voice samples in very small packets, we can create the illusion of a real-time circuit between two people. Right. And I'll have it all done by packet switching. So uh, that's also known as fast packet switching. Now, now that would seem to, to involve more uh, use of bandwidth because now you'd have not only the, the digitized voice, but you have the, the headers and trailers for the Well, packets. it doesn't take very much extra capacity for the headers and trailers. And uh, yeah, it's used a little bit more, but uh, you gain more. Uh, you, you come out ahead. More circuits by. Well, by the cost of the data transmission coming down and down and down. So. Uh, I mean, you would cut out the silence, right? But I guess you would they cut did out the anyway, silence, right? right? Well, we. That's one of the tricks, you know. Uh -huh. If you're talking, I'm not talking usually. Right. And that saves fifty percent of the of the channel right there. Mm -hmm. And then there are pauses between utterances. Yes. And that's some more time you save. Uh, and you, you save enough that uh, in, the, uh, in the work that we did together over packet cable, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, uh, one part, which was the packet tax product, right. was based on, on about a four to one voice saving. Uh, yes, and in, in fact, I saw recently that the cable people now are, are saying, why can't we get into telephony? We'd like oh, to bring they will telephones. Be. Oh, they will be. But uh, It's well, coming. Why couldn't they do it five years ago? Well, it's coming. Everything takes time. Patience, my boy, patience. <laughs> so uh, how did you get the idea for the Telebit modem? 
Well, you know, we uh, modems uh, are great when they work, but yes. there are a lot of rotten phone lines out there. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea was, uh, could we build a modem that was designed for rotten telephone lines instead of good telephone lines? And because uh, there's so many of them, you know, yes, and they always come at the wrong time. And they're you know. always cheaper. And cheaper. So the idea was, well, okay, let's uh, send a whole bunch of signals simultaneously, find out what part of the telephone passband uh, is there, measure its noise, and then send the theoretic amount of energy mm -hmm. in each of those mm -hmm. bands. Uh, and that does two things. First, it gives you a very high data rate. Yes. And secondly, it, it runs through anything you want to throw against it. And the interesting uh -huh. thing is that the Telebit modems are doing great in Eastern Europe, where right. they have all these rotten lines oh, and can't use anything course. else. China. Yes. But the kicker for a while has been this equipment couldn't be exported. Mm -hmm. So That's, That seems it's, odd because it's Well, it, had, it used a signal processing chip. Oh, I see. Remember a couple of years, a year yeah, or two right. ago, that they had all the new. Cold yeah. War on all that anyway, stuff. Anyway, uh, I wonder, yeah, well, we had Ted Brown on the show actually mm -hmm. a while back, and he showed us that. We actually got to see right at the end of the show a plot of which uh -huh. frequency bins right. uh, were okay and which ones uh, mm -hmm. weren't. The modem figures that, that out all the time. That's a great modem. Great product. So what is the Metricom system? Metricom system is an interesting one. They're doing very nicely. Uh, they're located over at Campbell. And uh, it's a couple of pieces put together. One is a new electronic meter. You know that meter you have in your house? I mean, power meter. Power meter, that little wheel goes watt, around. Watt meter. It's been, watt hour been meter. designed, it's beautifully designed. It's been working for about 90 years without change. Right. Okay, first thing we do is replace it with an all-electronic unit. And then we send measurement signals from those meters out over the power lines, the little packets. Mm -hmm. And then all the houses on the same transformer we treat as a local area network. And then we have a packet radio that sends signals. And you put that the on city. each transformer? Each each cluster of houses, that's yeah. A, that's a lot of transmitters. Right, there, there's a fair number, and we and uh, the guys have learned how to build a network and stable. Mm -hmm. They use frequency hopping, and uh, it's a very robust network. And it permits the electric utilities to uh, uh, save energy. It, uh, it permits a much better job of managing their resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are major trials in August. There must be about nine or ten major utilities now. And uh, it's growing uh, because any energy uh, that can be saved, well, most of the, the problem of electric utilities is a big peak load. Mm -hmm. So this way you can measure energy at the time of the day. Right. So you can encourage people to use their energy off hours. And that saves the utilities from having to build more capacity. Because, so, because you have a, a more precise measurement? You, you, know, you know when you, you used electricity. I guess you know when each person used yeah, electricity. That's right. You know, I lived in New Zealand for a little bit, uh, right after Packet Technologies, in fact. And uh, they had an odd way to handle things there. They would just, the power company could send a signal down the power line and mm -hmm. turn off your breaker. Yeah, Metricom so does that too. <laughs> That's sort of Procrustean way. Yes, but, right. So there's more sophisticated ways of doing it. Yeah. And that's the sort of system that, that Metricom has. Well, that sounds, uh, sounds good. Uh, so what about uh, the future? Do you see anything for the future of communications? Oh, gee, it's just beginning. It's just uh, beginning. Just beginning. I was remarking uh, uh, to some of your colleagues uh, for the program that around 1960, it looked at, looked at the future and decided there's about five decimal orders of magnitude of improvement still ahead. And technology's been moving very rapidly, and we still see about the same amount. So the, the tremendous pace of electronics that we see now is continuing so you say and will continue. Five orders of magnitude. I think so. And you think, but that's mostly gigabits. just uh, quantitative speed up. Well, when you change, any time you change anything quantitatively, mm -hmm. by a factor of ten, you change quality. For example, you walk five miles an hour, automobile goes fifty miles an hour. Mm -hmm an airplane at 500 miles an hour. Right. Just changing speed. Totally right. different right. concepts. So same thing with communication. As we go up in our data rates, we'll see all digital television, we'll see tremendous number of channels, uh, high definition television. Interactive television? Interactive. All that good stuff. All that good stuff. All that good stuff. So it's coming. Uh, do you think there's a best medium or protocol for communication? No, there's, uh, there's no one best medium. Everything has an ideal place, 
and uh, it would be like a a carpenter with uh, just a saw in his toolbox, no hammer, oh, I see, no, I see. no chisel. So I think that uh, when you design communication systems, you want as big a toolbox as you can because every situation is different. So that's why you sort of are a generalist or keep in touch with all the different uh, parts of the... Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun, too. Um, uh, what is Comprint, by the way? This is the one... Oh, Comprint was an early, early company, and... Uh, we made a uh, printer using electroresistive paper. And uh, it was an interesting case that uh, we also had a process for printing uh, on plain paper through mm -hmm. carbon ribbon. But uh, the company found that uh, there's, it had so much business in, in, the, in this silvery paper. Yes. One of the, this is the early printers, right? right? right that uh, the president decided there's no need to do anything else. Oh, no. <laughs> True story. Oh, well, and it happens all the, the time. The company was doing great. Then it went off the cliff. Closed because the better technology came along, and they yeah. didn't follow. Closed the patent office. Huh? Well, anyway, I guess uh, it's great to have you here. And, well, and, it's uh, great being here. And we'd like to have you back sometime. Well, thank you. Thanks my so pleasure. So, thank you for watching High Tech Heroes. Be sure to watch High Tech Heroes again next week. Au revoir. So great. So out for pizza and beer. Thank you for joining us this week for High Tech Heroes. Be sure to watch High Tech Heroes again next week when we will bring you more entertaining information about the people and ideas behind the scenes in high tech industry. And now, this is your announcer, Margie Foote, wishing you the best of luck and a pleasant week. Au revoir. This episode of High Tech Heroes has been made possible in part by grants from Merrick International of Mountain View, California, Linksys Incorporated of West Lafayette, Indiana, Kinetic Microscience of San Jose, California, and Cybernetic Arts of Sunnyvale, California.